Do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Yes. That's a good start. Why is the resurrection so important? Do you believe the resurrection is fundamental for our salvation? Okay. Paul, in writing about the resurrection, said, If Christ did not rise, the preaching was in vain. Our faith is futile. Those who have fallen asleep or died in Christ have perished, if indeed Christ did not rise. In fact, if in this life we have hope in Christ only, we would be of all men most to be pitied, if indeed Christ did not rise. But I'm here to say he is risen. The importance of the resurrection is not only fundamental to our salvation, but it is foundational to many of the truths that we hold dear. So the next question I would have for you is, why do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Okay. That's what I want to talk with you about this morning. This morning we're going to start in 1 Corinthians 15. The title of the message is The Reality of the Resurrection. It will be my goal over the next few weeks to preach through the entire chapter, the chapter of the resurrection. But today, God willing, we will try to make it through the first 11 verses. In these first 11 verses, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, trying to help them overcome a faulty thinking that was prevalent in Greeks among that day and time. See, the Greeks believed that the body was bad. And so the next life would just be of the spirit. So the idea of resurrecting the body was foolish to them. So the Corinthians, who were definitely impacted by these Grecian ideas, were struggling with the idea of the resurrection. So Paul, in this chapter, begins with pointing out the central fact of the resurrection of Christ. From the resurrection of Christ, he points out that we, too, will have resurrection. And this is going to be great for us over the next few weeks. It'll dovetail nicely into what we studied in First and Second Thessalonians. But today he's primarily focusing on the reality of the resurrection. And Paul gave us four reasons why we should believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to look at this morning. So if you have a copy of God's Word, I encourage you to make your way to First Thessalonians chapter, or excuse me, First Corinthians chapter 15. And as I said, God willing, we'll make our way through the first 11 verses. But as you found the place and as you're able, would you stand with me for a simple demonstration of the respect for the reading of God's word? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand. And by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Most of all, who are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am least of the apostles, 
unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach. And so you believed. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this resurrection day in which we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, we pray as we study these excellent examples of evidence that we can have to the reality of this resurrection, that, Father, you would bless us with a greater faith because of it. Lord, we pray that our lives would be changed because of the truth that is in the resurrection. And through this, Father, we will be better because we are here today. This, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, thank you. You may be seated. As we go through these first 11 verses, there are four different specific evidences that Paul points to. But the main idea I want you to get, if you're taking notes this morning... Inside your bulletin is an opportunity to fill in a couple blanks. If you've downloaded our church application, there's also an opportunity inside our application. But this is the main idea this morning. We have excellent evidence for the reality of the resurrection. We have excellent evidence for the reality of the resurrection. And as I said before, when I asked if you believe in the resurrection, almost all of you, it sounded like, agree. So you do not need to be convinced of the resurrection, but I would love to give you more substance for the foundation of that belief in an effort to strengthen your faith in Christ and in his resurrection. But no doubt in a room this size, someone might be listening in online. Some have not yet made a decision to follow Christ. But as we look to the simple evidence, I pray that today would be a day for you to believe. Now let's take a look at the evidence that we are given. First in verses 1 and 2, it says, And I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. And by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So what would be this first evidence that Paul is pointing to that proclaims the reality of the resurrection? He was not pointing to a historical fact per se, but he was pointing to a living example. And who was he talking to? How many times did you hear the word you? He was talking to the Corinthian believers. And he was saying, you guys are evidence of the resurrection. Even further, by extension, we are evidence for the resurrection. I wrote this down for point number one. The first excellent evidence, the testimony of the church. Paul was saying, you as believers are evidence for the resurrection. Think of it this way. If you are a child of God, if you are a follower of Christ, that means at some point in your life, you reached out by faith and called on the name of the Lord. And he heard you. And you are evidence that Jesus Christ is alive today. You are that evidence because your life is changed. You called on the name of the Lord. He answered. And that's evidence that our Savior is risen. And that's what we're talking about. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. 
Behold, the new has come. So there's a difference that comes when we receive Christ. And that's what we're talking about. Think of it this way. We were singing about the victory we have in Christ, the freedom that we have in Christ. We have been set free first from sin and guilt. That we have all sinned, and that sin has brought about guilt upon us. But when we chose to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, guess what? We are now free. We are free indeed. So we live differently, free from guilt. Well, not only do we have freedom from guilt, but we also have freedom in our grief. Remember when we were going through 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who have fallen asleep, lest you grieve as the rest of the world does who has no hope. Because if we believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, even so with him, he will bring those who have fallen asleep in Christ. It's not that we don't miss our loved ones. But we don't grieve like the rest of the world because we have hope. Not only that, the hope that we have is a living hope. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Loved ones, our lives are different because of Christ. The way we live, the places we go, we are evidence of a risen Savior. And that's really what Paul's talking about. But as you look back again at verse 2, he says something that's somewhat interesting. In verse 2 he says, at the end, unless you believed in vain. He's saying, all of you guys are evidence for the resurrection. Unless... You believed in vain. What is he talking about there? Is it possible for someone to believe in Jesus, but that not being saving faith? Is it possible for someone to say, yes, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but I'm really not interested in having life with him? Well, this is what James talked about in James chapter 2. And James differentiates between simple faith and saving faith. He differentiates between a genuine faith and a faith that is in vain. Look what he says. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Implied answer? No. No. It's not that we are saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. And that is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works. But if we have genuine faith, saving faith, our life will be different. And that's what James is talking about. So he is recognizing, Paul has recognized that some people didn't have the right type of faith. But saving faith will make us different. And the difference is evidence of a risen Savior. Now look with me again in verse 3, if you will. And we have in verses 3 and 4 another evidence. Listen to what he says. For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Then he was buried, and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. So what is he pointing to second as a Another witness, another evidence of the resurrection. He's pointing to the teachings of the Bible. I wrote that down for point number two. The teachings of the Bible are evidence. Now bear in mind, Paul is not saying the Bible says so, and that settles it. He's saying more than that. And by that I mean, is Paul referring to the New Testament witness or the Old Testament witness when he says, I delivered to you what I also received, 
that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. Is he talking about New Testament or Old Testament? Old? How do you know? Well, there's a good couple ways you could know this. I mean, you could realize that the book of 1 Corinthians, one of the first epistles, one of the earlier epistles that Paul wrote, and that was likely written around A.D. 50, maybe A.D. 45, A.D. 55, somewhere around there. And at that time when Paul wrote this, most of the New Testament hadn't been written yet. In fact, there could have been a gospel floating around at that point, but still not everyone agrees upon that. So more than likely, Paul was talking about Old Testament. And why is that significant? Paul, in a sense, what Paul was saying is, this has always been part of God's plan. He told us this was going to happen. It happened. Now I'm telling you that it happened. See, fulfilled prophecy is excellent internal evidence for the validity of Scripture. But beyond that, what he's saying is, this is something that God has promised. So we shouldn't be surprised that it happened. And in a sense, he's talking about three things. Talking about the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And I want to look at each one of those individually. First, he says, for Christ died for our sins in accordance with scriptures. What's significant about that? It's not just that he died, but why did he die? Because... We could argue that everyone dies. So the fact that Jesus died is not as significant except for the fact of why. And why did he die? For our sins. So the first point that I wrote down is the debt from our sin. As we're understanding the foundational truths of the gospel, he says this is the gospel. The first thing of the gospel is Christ died for our sins. Talking about that we had a debt. And who is we? All of us. For all have sinned and fallen short from the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. So we were separated from God because of the debt of our sin. Now was that spoken about in the Old Testament? Certainly. The reference I wrote down was uh, Isaiah 59 and it says in Isaiah 59, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you that he does not hear. So when Paul is saying that he died for our sins according to Scripture, likely he's referring back to the places in Scripture that says that our sin brought about a debt. But then he says, Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. Then he says, then he was buried. What is significant about the burial of Christ? Yeah, the, the simple fact that we only bury people that are dead. In other words, the first point that Christ died for our sins is really pointing to uh, the reason why Christ died. But now it's pointing to the reality of Christ's death, that he was in fact buried. So I wrote it down this way, the death of our Savior. And at times you may have wondered why it was redundant to say he died, then he was buried and rose again. But he's saying the reason for his death, the fact of his death and then his victory over death. Now, Scripture talks a lot about why Christ died for us, and it was for our sins, and also talks the fact that, in fact, he did die. Isaiah 53 speaks a lot of that. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried out our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds, we are healed. Isaiah 53. 
And then the third part of that gospel message is that he rose again, raised on the third day accordance to scriptures. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, why is that significant part of the gospel? Yeah, he's alive. But what does his resurrection signify? That it was victory. You know, loved ones, Jesus was not the only person that was ever crucified on a cross. In fact, on the day he was crucified, how many people were crucified? Three total. That was not a record in Rome. In fact, I think the Roman record was 2,000 people in a single day was the record under the Roman Empire for crucifixion. But needless to say, there were lots of people crucified. What the resurrection did, it was a declaration of our salvation. I wrote that down for letter C. The declaration of our salvation. In other words, God looked at Jesus and said, you did it. And you did it right. His resurrection was the declaration of victory. It was a statement that not just that Jesus died, but that he rose again. Now, do we see the resurrection anywhere in the Old Testament? Well, Paul said, According to the scriptures. And if I just told you he was referring to the Old Testament, there must be places in the Old Testament that refer to the resurrection. I'll give you a few. Uh, You can look in Psalm 16. It says you will not allow your Holy One uh, to experience. um, uh, Let me look. And then in Psalm 22, which will be on your screen as well, uh, that speaks of the death and ultimately the resurrection, but in Psalm 16, you will not allow your blessed one to, to see corruption. Uh, Psalm 16, 10, for you not abandon my soul in Sheol or let the Holy One see corruption. But Psalm 22 also says this, for dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Sound familiar? I can count all my bones. They stare at me and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. Then look. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. What happened from being on the cross to now saying, I'm going to be alive and I'm going to tell it to everyone? Resurrection certainly implied. You could look at Hosea, minor prophet, Hosea chapter 6. There's a couple verses I'd look at. It says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us, and on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. So yes, the Old Testament does point to Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and that is evidence for the resurrection of Christ. And it's a significant evidence at that. But there's another piece of evidence that Paul talks about. Take a look back again in 1 Corinthians 15. And then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Now I will just say for the sake of... Remind me, remind me that it was Cephas, then the twelve. Okay? Because that'll come up later. But set that aside. Of those people, Cephas and the twelve, and then to over 500 at once, who are these people to us? How do they serve as evidence for the resurrection? They were eyewitnesses. I wrote this down for... Point number three, the testimony of eyewitnesses. For anybody's story to be historically valid, it has to be eyewitness, not hearsay, and it has to be early. 
And that's what these individuals demonstrate. An early eyewitness account of the resurrection of Christ. Their testimony, very important. But the significance of their testimony is not just the fact that they said, Hey, I saw Jesus risen. But the significance of the eyewitness testimony is the fact of what changed in their life. So I wrote this down for letter A under point number three. The apostles were changed. Think of it this way. Where did the apostles go immediately after Jesus was crucified? They went into hiding. They went, locked the door, and they were scared. You can see this in John chapter 20, John 20, 19. It says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. So up to this point, the disciples had not seen the risen Lord. They had heard that he was risen, but they hadn't seen him. And what were they doing? They were hiding. Now, just a little bit later in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4, they had seen the risen Lord. And what were they doing now? They were boldly proclaiming that they had seen him. And in fact, the very people they were hiding from, they were standing in front of boldly. Take a look at this. It says, When they saw the boldness of Peter, John, and perceived that they were uneducated common men, meaning that they didn't just hatch up this plan themselves, they didn't just try to convince everyone, it says, no, they were astonished, and they had recognized that they had been with Jesus. That's an incredible piece of evidence, that these apostles were radically transformed at first They did not have any courage because their master, their teacher was taken from them. Then all of a sudden something changed three days later to now they were boldly proclaiming Jesus everywhere they went. And that thing that changed is that he is risen. And that was significant because of their eyewitness testimony and they were transformed. But even beyond that, And I wrote this for letter B. The apostles were constant, consistent, excuse me. The apostles were consistent. What do I mean by that? Each one of these individuals, the apostles who were living witnesses, living eyewitnesses, each one of them came to a point where they had to either change their story or they had to be executed. And in fact, of the original 12 that we were speaking of, Judas obviously has already killed himself. The rest, except for John, John the apostle was exiled on Patmos, so he was just living in exile. But nonetheless, the rest of them, each of them were martyred because they said Jesus is alive. And you know how many of them changed their story? None. Not a single one. Now, you might think that people would lie. You might think that. You might even think that people would willingly continue to lie. But how many people do you know would willingly die for a lie they know is not true? Now, people may die for something they believe to be true, but if they know it to be false... Why would they die for it? So the eyewitnesses are excellent evidence. But Paul gives us another piece of evidence. And this he does following in verses 7 and through 10. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So he's really speaking of two people that I want to focus on. James and he himself, who was Saul, who became Paul. What do these two guys have in common? 
Well, first, who is this James being spoken of? Well, there are two people named James early on in the New Testament that it could have been. One is James, the brother of John. Was it him? No. And why? Remember when I told you to tell me something? What did I tell you to tell me? Cephas and the twelve. Cephas is the Aramaic name for Peter. So he had already appeared to Peter and the rest of the twelve. Who is James, the brother of John? He was one of the twelve. Not only that, but he also was later martyred really early on. So more than likely, Paul is not talking to him. Otherwise, he would have been redundant. Who is the other James? Yes, the brother, half-brother of Jesus. And what do we know about him? Was he a person of faith? Not at first. So in fact, James, the brother, half-brother of Jesus, and Saul were both skeptics. But they changed. So I wrote this down, point number four, the transformation of skeptics. And this is a big deal. Loved ones, this is a huge deal because it's one thing for a disciple who wanted Jesus to be alive, who had vested their very interest in it, but James and Saul had no vested interest. In fact, they had no reason to want Jesus to be alive. In fact, both of them probably didn't. First, let's look at James. It says, then he appeared to James. Now, James, as we said, is the half-brother of Jesus. You can write it first, the conversion of James for letter A. We can see in the Gospel of John that James and the other brothers of Jesus, that is, the biological half-brothers, did not believe. Take a look at John chapter 7. It says, So his brothers said to him, that is to say to Jesus, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing, for no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Why did they say that? For not even his brothers believed in him. They were mocking him, saying, yeah, you're claiming that you can do all these things. You should really go make yourself known. James did not believe in his brother. But after he saw the risen Lord, his life was transformed. The testimony of an enemy, what we would call enemy attestation, is significant evidence because they have no vested interest in seeing what they said they saw. And that is great significance to us. Does anybody know what James the Apostle was known as? Colloquial, his nickname? He was known as Camel Knees. Because after he saw the risen Lord and realized he was wrong for most of his life, he spent a lot of time in prayer, so much so that his knees became looking like camel knees. But nevertheless, that was a conversion that was significant. But then there's also that of Saul, who became Paul, the conversion of Saul. Now, is that significant? No doubt, because Saul not only was a skeptic, he was an enemy of the faith. Uh, in Philippians chapter 3, this is Paul's kind of autobiography, and I'll quote a little of it from you. Uh, first, it says that he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. According to the law, a Pharisee. According to zeal, a persecutor of the church. According to righteousness under the law, blameless. So Saul at this time in his life had a lot of things going for him. You remember, he was a student of Gamaliel. He was well known. He was persecuting the church. He had no vested interest in seeing Jesus. But as many of you know, on the road to Damascus, he encountered the risen Lord, and his life was ever changed. Continuing in Philippians chapter 3, he says, 
But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness from the law, but that which comes through faith. The righteousness of God that depends on faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. That by any means I might obtain the resurrection from the dead. Now Paul was not uncertain to his position in Christ as if he wasn't sure if he was saved. But he was uncertain as to the means in which he would die. He was saying, I don't know if I'm going to be tortured. I don't know if I'm going to be killed for Christ. I don't know if Christ will come first. But what I do know is I'm willing to do anything for him. He goes on to say, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me His own. He had quite a testimony. But part of that testimony was the fact that he at one time was antagonistic to Christ. In fact, look back at 1 Corinthians 15, 9. It says this, For I am the least of apostles, unworthy to be called apostle, because I persecuted the church. He was very antagonistic. And some people might say, well, how on earth did Saul, who was antagonistic to the very church, become turned in such a way that he'd say he'd do anything for Christ? He saw the risen Savior, and that changed him. So much so he said this, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Loved ones, many times we might think that God gives up on us. Maybe you would think, you know what? I haven't been as active as I should in my faith. I haven't been reading my Bible like I should. I I haven't been doing the things like I should, so God's probably upset with me. He's probably given up on me. But you know what Paul was able to say? Look at verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God within me. You know what grace is? You just spell it out as God riches at Christ's expense. That is the unmerited favor that God has for us, not because we're good, but because he's good. And that's what Paul was able to testify to. Even though I made all these mistakes, the moment I came to God, he was there waiting on me. Now let's review. The main idea that I wanted you to really get away from this is that we have excellent evidence for the reality of the resurrection. And I've given you four specific pieces of evidence. First, the testimony of the church. Second, the teachings of the Bible. And three in particular, the debt from our sin, the death of our Savior, and the declaration of our salvation. That is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The third is the testimony of the eyewitnesses. The apostles were changed, and the apostles were consistent. Fourth, the transformation of the skeptics. We have the conversion of James and the conversion of Saul. Now, one last verse, and then I'll be done just with this. Look at verse 11. Paul says and finishes and says, Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed 
And this is really where I've been going this entire time. The message is that Jesus Christ loved you so much that he was willing to die. He was buried and he rose again. That's the truth. But you still have to believe it. You have to be able to put your faith in Christ. And I close with this, and this is what I wrote down as your concluding point. My relationship with Christ begins with believing in Him. Now, I, I know in a room this size with people listening in online, there are likely some in this room that have never put your faith in Christ. Maybe you've heard the gospel several times, and maybe you thought at one point you'll put your faith in Christ, but would there ever be a day then on Easter Sunday right here and right now to be able to recognize the truth claims that we have of a risen Savior and to be able to say, I want to put my faith in Him. That's my challenge to you. If you've never placed your faith in Christ, that's something you can do right here and right now. You can, in your own mind and in your own heart, be able to say, God, I believe that Jesus died and he rose again. And I want what he did to count for me. Would you save me from my sin? Now, I know many of you in this room have been a follower of Christ, some of you for many years. But the same relationship that is created by faith is the same relationship that is continued by faith. And if your faith has not as been as strong as what it could have been or should have been, today can be a day where you choose to make a difference in your life. You can choose to put your focus back on faith. As we remember the importance of the resurrection, the reality of the resurrection, that you'd be able to say, I want to continue to believe. That's what I want to pray about. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm thankful for each person that's here, those who are listening online. And Lord, I pray that we would be people of faith. Lord, I pray for the one that has never put their faith in you, that today would be a day where they turn to you and say, Lord, I believe in Jesus, and I want you to save me. Father, that we could see decisions being made here in our midst that would be of eternal significance. Lord, I also pray for those who are already believers, but maybe their faith is not what it once was, that today would be a day where individuals choose to trust you, and that through this, Father, you would be glorified, but that we would be better because of it. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.